Aloha Inuala, ka ukipa ina i kane, ka o inua o Lulani Arket. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation, and uh, my family on my Native Hawaiian father's side is the Kamea Moku Waipa family line on the big island of Hawaii. And my mother is the Lytle Gee family from Rapid City, South Dakota. We want to welcome all of you to the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation webinar, the Black Indigenous, Afro-Indigenous experience. Uh, we're thrilled to have you all with us and understand it's a fairly large group. And um, we just are, are, um, are really glad that we can address this topic. This is a moment of reckoning for America. We are at one of the most defining times in our history as human beings, as BIPOC people, and in the Native Arts and Cultures field. What we choose to address in our organizations and communities now has the ability to create a truly equitable future that can help shape the 21st century. Our efforts as Native and BIPOC peoples certainly require a truth telling about our histories and what has brought us to where we are now. For example, the intrinsic damage rooted in the doctrine of discovery. And prolonged challenges like the pandemic, climate change, and racial inequities in our country need persistent energy, rigor, and solutions. Literally, brown and black lives depend upon it. So since our first year of programming, a, de a decade ago actually, NACF has made significant strides in fulfilling its mission. NACF has nurtured indigenous artists success by offering support to individual artists, arts organizations and communities by conducting convenings, providing support to the field. NACF has strengthened artist reach, cultural knowledge and arts leadership capacity. Through tribal and community based awards, artists, organizations and projects we have advanced Native arts practice and mentorship efforts. We are dedicating the next 10 years to social, cultural, and environmental change through Native arts and collaboration. Our work will include the rematriation of a building in Portland, Oregon, to the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation ownership, and the creation of the Center for Native Arts and Cultures. The crisis of the pandemic and racial justice this, and climate change are really forcing tough questions about who we really are as a country and who we can be. At NACF, we drafted a pledge statement that is on our website, we did this back in July, that includes specific action to support black peoples in this country and BLM. I want to especially thank Mark Herrera Brooke Thompson and Amber Starks for helping us think through this webinar series. This is the first in the series. And I also want to thank our many supporters and our funders for helping us to continue to do the work that we do. We are really grateful. So we begin this webinar today that is celebrating the experiences of Black Indigenous, Afro-Indigenous people. We will be examining the relationships between Black and Native cultural identities, notions of community recognition, artistic practice, and activism. This is a community that many have yet to fully understand. Thousands of people in the United States identify as Black Indigenous, Afro-Indigenous, having both Indigenous and African-American lineages. You will have the opportunity to hear the work of these artists, these culture bearers and these activists who through their practices act as catalyzing agents in our communities and challenge legacies of colonial disempowerment. Every one of us deserves equal access to a full vibrant life, which is essential to a healthy and just society. Every one of us deserves governance and institutions that operate fairly based on principles that uphold equity compassion and truth. Arts and creativity are one of the most powerful ways to foster empathy and understanding, promote cultural resilience and diverse experiences, 
and provoke us to a greater transformation. They inspire us to become better human beings. These benefits guide all of our work at NACF. We will continue strengthening our efforts with Native artists and communities and strive with Black and POC relatives to secure a more just society. So again, mahalo nui loa. Thank you so much for being with us today. And it's over to you, Ruben. <sighs> Ruben, you're on uh, mute. Yeah, mute. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ruben Frakeni, and I'm the director of National Artists Fellowships at Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. Uh, we have panelists um, from Juneau, Alaska, Brooklyn, New York, Klamath Falls, Oregon, and there are people on the on the webinar here from all over the Indigenous Americas. My family is from the borderlands of Southeast Arizona and Northern Mexico. I'm Rocky and Mexican American. In, in our language, we say Liosem Chaniabo, greetings. Uh, Native Arts and Cultures Foundation and myself are currently located in Portland, Oregon, in the metropolitan region here, which rests along the Columbia and Willamette Rivers which uh, are the home of the traditional village sites of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, mm -hmm. uh, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along these rivers. Uh, today, Portland, has a diverse and vibrant Native community that is over 60,000 strong, representing more than 350 tribes, uh, both local and distant. Um, we want to take this opportunity to offer our respectful recognition to the land here, uh, to the Native communities in our region today and to those that have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Since our activities are shared on the internet, I also want to take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within these technologies, structures, and ways of thinking that we use every day, but are not always available in indigenous communities and marginalized communities at large. Um, this space too is fraught with colonial with that, uh, we invite you to consider, well, after land acknowledgement, what next in our shared responsibility towards reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. So um, with those formalities complete, um, just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, one is that due to time constraints, we're not going to be fielding questions in a Q of A kind of format um, from the audience for the panelists. Um, but we will have the chat room open. As you can see, feel free to chat amongst yourselves and post any thoughts that you're, um, that you're having. Um, I also want to encourage you to fill out a poll that we'll be posting uh, in the midst of the webinar. The poll is just a gathering of simple demographic information that is really important for us to have um, for our outreach, uh, for our program development, and to inform our, our funders and stakeholders. Um, it's completely anonymous, so uh, no pressure there. And then after the webinar, we'll also be um, sending out a survey, um, which has some different information, really your reactions to the webinar. Also important for our, um, for our funders, for our program development and for our outreach. So with that, I will hand it over to Stephen Blanchett, who is our moderator today. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening depending on where you are in the world um thank you so much uh, Kuyana lulani uh, Kuyana ruben um for that um we're gonna do uh, i'm gonna quickly uh 
introduce our, our four uh, panelists and, and, and uh, speak to who they are and where they come from. And I will allow them, we will allow us some time for them to further um, tell about themselves um, shortly after that. So my name is Steve uh, Kachung Blanchett, um, Stephen Blanchett, and uh, my Yupik name is Kachung, and I am Yupik and originally from Nunapichok or Mamtagishok, uh, Alaska. Uh, we also have uh, Martha Redbone, um, who is uh, Cherokee, Choctaw, and Shawnee, an African American descent. Um, Natalie Ball, who's Black, uh, Modoc, and uh, Klamath. And finally, we have Amber Starks, who's uh, Muscogee and uh, Creek uh, citizen. So we do want to have some, we look forward to this, this conversation. Um, this has been something that I have been uh, working on and, and, you know, just very much a part of my artistry for, for many, many years, and which has informed my practice and informed so many parts of, of who I am. And, um, and uh, so I first want to uh, in, have it, introduce and invite um, Martha Redbone to, to tell a little bit more uh, about her personal um, self and give a little biography about who she is and, and a little presentation. So Martha, please take it away. Hey cousin, how are you, man? Hello everyone. Um, my name's Martha Redbone. I'm Cherokee, Shawnee, Choctaw, African American, and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> um, it's such an honor to be a part of this panel. I'm so grateful to everyone. Uh, this has been um, a huge part of um, everything that I am and has been a, a great influence on the music um, that I make, that I have made for many, many years. And um, I guess, uh, uh, you know, I have a, an interesting background because uh, I was actually raised by my grandparents and um, in uh, Kentucky, in a coal mining town. And so, um, you know, I, my parents were young, very young when they had me, they got married and, um, and they spent a, you know, kind of very uh, passionate uh, marriage, I'll say that in, in the nicest possible way without um, offending anyone. But um, there was a lot of back and forth. And so my grandparents thought it would be best that I would stay with them while they sorted out their kind of young life. Um, as I got to be older, I um, came back to New York City for middle school. And, and that's when everything began. So when you're in your own hometown and, you know, you're being raised by your grandparents, this, these are just, you know, this is your family. You don't really have a sense of, well, and for myself, I didn't have a sense of uh, an identity, so to speak, you know, not paying attention to, you know, what race or class or, you know, tribe. It, we just, you, you, that's just your, your grandma and your grandpa. And, um, and it was the outside world who has had lots of fights trying to argue and decide who I am supposed to choose, telling me who I have to choose. So um, when I came back to New York City in middle school, um, I had a lot of remarks about where to fit in. And I had people saying, you know, is that Chinese lady your mother? You know, and are uh, you Puerto Rican? You speak Spanish? You Dominican? You look Dominican? Are you from Haiti? Are you Jamaican? Are you this? You know, and so there was all of that kind of stuff. And and I remember um, when I came back to New York at that time, that's the very same year that my parents left. I was split up for good. And, um, and I knew I looked like my dad. And I asked, I remember asking my mom, are you Chinese? Are we Chinese? You know, and she was like, what? You know, and says no she's and she was old school so she would use the term Indian you know because that's how they were back east back in those days in her time and so um, that began kind of like uh, the beginning of a very long journey of um, understanding how I was raised and understanding um, what was been what had been taught to me by my grandparents which was very matter-of-fact 
you know, um, sewing, quilting, um, baking, the food, hunting, all of these things that we had, um, you know, in Appalachia and basically mountain life and our prayers and the songs. I just love the songs. I love the melodies. I didn't know that it meant it was something and a lot of praying. And so, um, and my grandpa was chocolate. Somebody says, mentioned Choctaw, so shout out. Halito, um, My grandpa uh, came from Mississippi. Um, he was actually born in um, Moundville, Alabama, and then raised down in uh, between um, Mobile and, and also in, in um, Philadelphia. So they kind of traveled a lot back in those days. And then he came up to work in the coal mines in the 1940s. And that's where he met my grandma. And the rest is history. But um, one of the most profound uh, things that um, came to me as tw that 12 year old in middle school was um, remember, remembering playing these records that my dad had, um, all these soul records, and I have them right, you know, on the shelf over there. And I remember playing, you know, James Brown over there, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And then my mom saying, so is that all you're proud of? Is that the only thing you're proud of? Don't I count for something? And I thought, uh oh, I don't know what I did, but you know, I thought I was like kind of doing some soul train dances and now I'm in trouble for doing something that I didn't know. And my mom said, do not erase us. She said, do not participate in the genocide of your own people. Do not erase us. And since that time, I have heard that very same thing from many, many people over time. I refuse to participate in the genocide of my own people. So I didn't know, of course, at 12 years old, I had no idea that I was going to be a musician. I had no idea that I was going to be performing on stage, but I loved all of these things. And when I had uh, the responsibility as a public person performing, you do storytelling, I wanted to honor this. I wanted to honor the woman who worked two jobs um, to put us through school, to, to, to educate me, to honor, you know, these grandparents who looked after me and fed me when my mom was going through tough times. I wanted to honor that. I wanted to honor um, my father, who was very young. He, he came from the tobacco fields in North Carolina. And actually, my dad is also not only African-American, but he's also Lumbee. My grandfather was Lumbee. And I only found that out a few years before my dad passed away. Um, so anyways, that's a long story short. And that has been a major influence on um, celebrating all that I am and not being forced to um, have to pick a side because I'm all of these things. And I remember another time like being in like maybe 17 and kind of like, um, you know, kind of like the radical African-American, you know, era, like all of the, you know, I guess it was during like the kind of, um, must have been like during the Cosby show or a different world TV, you know, sitcom and, and um, the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air where everyone was wearing their kente cloths and everyone was, you know, had the hair wraps and, you know, Queen Latifah and all of that. And I remember saying um, to my mom, you know, um, we don't say black, we say African-American, you know, because society treats us blah, da, 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 you know, and I was like spewing off some kind of, you know, some kind of, you know, thing that came from some young people in the African-American community. And I remember my mother washing her dishes and looked at me and said, society also said that we were animals. You believe what society tells you? You believe everything that society tells you? You know, society says that the African is only three-fifths human. The society said once that we were not human at all. You believe society and you just accept what society tells you. And that has come back to me a lot too. So um, anyway, long story short, let me give you a quick little snapshot. And here's a blast from the past. <laughs> a very young Steven and a very young Martha, <laughs> a very young Bamua. And, uh, and I found that one from the old files, you know, and uh, we did a lot of shows together um, over the years, and um, they were like my favorite, favorite vocal group. And you know, I'm a fan. I'm fangirling. Um, here's my mom and my dad. I'm not able to see that. You, 
Person. Oh, I need to do, okay. I need to do that thing, don't I? You know how old school I am. All right, here we go. Can everybody see? Uh, down the bottom, there's a share screen. Yeah, I just did that. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. Did it come through? Okay. Okay, uh, let me see. Can you see that, guys? No. Well, this worked in our tech rehearsal, but we're not. It did, didn't it? There, it is coming through. I see it. It did come through. How about now? Not yet. Dang. I'll wait a few minutes just in case. Well, um. Yes, no? Let's, let's try to figure that out. Um, maybe Laura can help us out here in a little bit, but let's, let's uh, in the interest of time, let's um, thank you so much Martha for sharing those stories. I, I love, I love hearing. I don't know why it's not working. I'll try and work that out. So, Sorry about that guys. Oh, it's okay. We'll, we'll get that working. Um, uh, maybe when we're talking about our professional practice, we can yes. uh, do that. So Amber, Amber Starks, uh, I want to, can't wait to see and hear and learn more about you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, Hesche, everyone. I'm so excited to be here and I'm so excited to be in community um, with all these other brilliant and amazing Afro-Indigenous um, relatives. Um, and I want to tell you about myself, but I thought it would be really great to bring my ancestors along with me, my peoples. So I am going to um, have them. I, I want you to see them as I'm talking and I'm telling you about myself. So let me set that up and I'll get started. Okay, can you all see that? Yes, that's coming through. Okay, let me start that. Okay, so Hesche, um, uh, Amber Chehotef Kudos. Hi there, my name is Amber. I am a Muscogee Creek citizen. I'm also of Quapaw, Shawnee, Yuchi, and Cherokee descent. And I really like to um, differentiate because uh, the Muscogee Creek Nation um, recognizes me as a citizen um, and my other tribes who I descend from currently do not, but these are my people. These are the people that I come from and I always want to bring them along when I'm, um, when I'm introducing myself and um, calling myself who I am, right? So I identify as Afro-Indigenous and specifically I'm African-American uh, and Native American. Uh, I also identify as reconnecting, which means that um, because I didn't grow up around my tribe uh, or even within in, in an indigenous community, I spent a lot of time, I've had to spend a lot of time as an adult uh, learning what that means, learning what it means to be Muscogee, uh, learning what, what it means to come from people of Shawnee, Yuchi, Kwapa, um, and Cherokee descent. Um, and in addition, I'm, ra I'm racialized as a black woman and I grew up around black folks uh, for most of my life. And I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of being enculturated by Black folks who reminded me that I'm worthy and that the narrative of the outside world um, isn't always the whole truth, right? It's us who get to decide who we are, not the outside world. So um, as far back as I can remember, though, I always knew that I was Muscogee. Uh, I didn't really find out about being Kwapa, Shawnee, and Yuchi, and Cherokee until I was a little bit older, but once I knew, you know, I just knew, like, these are my people. This is, these are the people I come from, and just having that sense of pride. Um, my dad, um, so when I was younger, my dad used to tell me about Oklahoma and our people there and our family there and our land allotment. Um, and in a lot of ways, Oklahoma became this like, ah, you know, that place that I had to go to and I had to like reconnect with. But, you know, family struggles, financial struggles, um, you know, I, we never really got there. But anytime we had really hard times, I would just say, why don't we just move to Oklahoma? And uh, that never happened. <laughs> so I didn't even get to go to Oklahoma and set foot on, you know, my family's land until I was about 18. Um, and being there felt a little foreign at first because it just didn't seem real. Um, but I absolutely did feel a sense of pride. Uh, and I think for the first time I embodied being indigenous because of all of the stories like my dad used to tell me and all of the reminders that I was Muskogee. 
Um, and so there was like this realization that it, it actually is a thing. It, you know, this is who I am. Um, so after, you know, after that, I thought about Oklahoma in a different context. Um, and I thought about being Muscogee in a different context. Um, and this is around the same time the internet became a thing. And in college, you know, I, I was able to dive into the internet and try, like, find family names, find, you know, histories. And uh, it just opened my world up to me, my family's history, and reaffirms again that I was Muskogee, that I was Shawnee, Yuchi, Quapa, Cherokee, that I was indigenous. Um, but what really cemented it was my father's death. So my, when my dad died, my grandmother told us to you know, call the tribe and we did. And the tribe stepped in and supported us and um, helped my dad with our burial, with his burial and made sure my mom had money for um, his wake. And I felt so seen and I felt so loved and I felt so Muskogee, you know, I felt, um, I felt home and it was, yeah, I think it was the first time that like, it just like, I knew them and they knew me, right? And so um, I think it was from there on that I realized that I needed to do the work to reconnect. Like I needed to do the work to, um, to be Muskogee, not just to say it. And, and I have those same feelings around being Quapa and Cherokee and Yuchi and Shawnee. Um, and I've been spending a lot of time lately like on my Quapa heritage and the amazing things that I, like I've seen my grandfather, which was one of those pictures that you guys saw, one of my um, grandfathers, he was um, the first non-hereditary chief of the Quapa nation. And yeah, like I, I'm embodying this like duality of being black and indigenous. And I think for the first time I see myself too, holy and um, it's beautiful. And so I'm learning, um, I'm, lear I'm building community, I'm building relationship um, and I'm really speaking to Afro-indigeneity as much as I can um, and helping people to realize that we exist, we're here um, and we're not going anywhere, <laughs> so. Brianna, thank you for sharing your ancestors with us. <laughs> that was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful family. Thank um, you. Uh, next, we have Natalie Ball, um, who's sharing a little bit more about herself. Uh, Wakrisad, everybody. My name is Natalie Ball. I'm going to take you through um, just a quick video. I, my son and I were going through um, pictures, family pictures, and my work is heavy on vis the visual archive, so I just, I'm gonna give you, a, I'm just gonna share some images with you of my family and just talk about myself um, and where I come from. Uh, this, so my name is Natalie Ball. I come from, uh, born and raised in Portland, Oregon, but now I'm in Chilquin, Oregon. I'm a mom, I'm an artist. Um, so my family came to, Portland, Oregon from, so on my mom's side from rural Arkansas, and they were part of the Black diaspora, that movement to the Pacific Northwest, um, my mom's father specifically. And on my dad's side were Modoc and Klamath um, from Southern Oregon. And during the time of ter termination, um, it was either before or after or during. Um, well, termination is like a, a total act of genocide. And, it's to take your land away and take your identity at the same time by act of Congress. And so they left Portland for work and to live. And my dad comes from, from six children. And that's where my mom and dad met in uh, Portland, Oregon. And that's where I come from. And that's where my um, visual archives start uh, is in Portland. And I know we're on a three minute deadline. Like, can I keep going or? Um, yeah, so I so I built a visual archive. It's it's like heavy in autoethnography and family photographs, but also the research that I've done to then fill in the gaps. And I feel like as a woman, indigenous woman who's black and Indian, that there's a lot of gaps and I'm working to filling those gaps, but also my work is about uh, reimagining and filling in spaces where those gaps can't be filled in. Um, and, and these are my ancestors and 
and I'll stop there and just continue on when we talk about our, our my work and my career. Um, but this is this is who I come from. Brianna, Brianna, that's, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is Ka Jung. Uh, this is, uh, I'm going to share, I guess, just a little bit about um, uh, kind of my, uh, a little bit of history, yeah, a little, you know, and this is, me as an indigenous person, as a black person, um, you know, I grew up in um, which is also called Bethel. And, uh, you know, at that time, um, and Nunapichok, where I also, where my mother is from, um, I'll, I'll maybe say a little bit in my, in my uh, mother's tongue. Uh, uh, David Blanchett, and David Blanchett, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Mewok. Uh, for letting me be here. So, you know, this, what I, what I was saying is my name is Kajung, also Stephen Blanchett. I'm, I grew up in, in a town called uh, or Bethel. I also grew up in a village called Nunapichok. My mom, my mother is, uh, her name is Aganak, um, but also known as um, Marie Mead. Uh, my father is David Blanchett. Um, my mother is Yupik, and grew up in, born and raised in, uh, in a small village of about 300 people uh, called Nunapichok. And uh, my father is from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, where he grew up, and, um, and he's black. And so both of them were very strong, <laughs> very opinionated, uh, strong personalities, right? Uh, my mom is, she's a culture bearer. She's a traditional dancer. She teaches language. She teaches the Yupik language at the university. Uh, my father um, is, a, is a minister. Uh, and he, uh, so I grew up as, you know, a preacher's kid, right? And so he um, started off, preaching in the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. So, uh, and was very much a, a force in my, both of them were uh, such great forces in my life um, and really shaped who I um, was to become and who I am. Um, and, you know, I found myself as a young child, uh, you know, growing up in a mostly native community. Um, in Alaska, we don't have reservations. Um, we had a different um, we had a different type of negotiation with the American government um, in negotiating. Um, in negotiate, we didn't have treaties and, and things like that. We we had a different type of negotiation. So we have we have this weird layers of different types of governance, right? We have tribal governance, but we also have these corporate systems, um, and so uh, so it, it you know it's just. There's so many, so many things just shaped shaped who I was and and who I am. Um, so, you know this this picture here, I guess it really is kind of an embodiment of of like who I am. There's Achung, I'm black, I'm in Bumiwa, I'm Yupik, and and it's this great huge mix. Um, Bumiwa, my band, yeah, this is my homies. Uh, I can get a little bit more into it, but. Uh, um, but this is our very first performance, uh, uh, not first performance, it was our very first uh, traveling type of gig that we did. Uh, it was our first tour. But, you know, you know, it was, you know, our way of explaining who we are as Black and, and who we are as Yupik, right? Um, so the dancing and, and all of that was really a huge part of, of, of our, our background. And this is my mom. 
Ahona. And uh, she was being honored at this, this event here, a festival back at home um, and uh, as a culture bearer. And so this, you know, these, a lot, these are our, this is my family. And uh, we were there just singing and, and drumming and dancing for her. Um, but this is the first, this is the last performance that we did um, before the, the, this, everything shut down in the global pandemic. This was, this was our last show and one of the last times I saw my um, brothers and, and Aussie. But, you know, this, so growing up um, out there in rural, rural uh, Yupik country, it really was, um, it really was a way for me to uh, connect. I really didn't, sometimes didn't, didn't connect with my black side because I was so in, in, in you know, involved and in, in so much in my native culture. Uh, you know, Yupik was my first language. Um, my father was very much wanting to, uh, at that time, he was really just a, about me learning about my culture and about my Yupik background, but also really enforcing the, my black side of me. Um, but yeah, I, it, it was you know very very interesting um, way to grow up, right? Um, we have this word in the Yupik language called um, and it's becoming aware. It means to become aware, um, and uh, sa is means kind of the universe. Uh, it means the the weather. It means outside. It also means spirit, um, and um, and it means it means awareness. And so I guess I want to pose the pose a question to you all. Um, and you know I've been like I want to say, uh, Martha, you were saying uh, in your introduction about being mistaken for so many things. I have been mistaken for, I mean, every, so many different cultures. Um, I fit in, you know, traveling around, touring um, through my music, um, really fit in into many, many places. But, you know, I'd say the only culture that I have not ever been mistaken is like someone like, are you, you know, Dominican? Are you Hawaiian? Are you Maori? Why, you know, all these different cultures. No one ever said, are you white? You know, <laughs> so that was one thing, the only one that I've never, ever been mistaken for. But, you know, um, black people, you know, we know, right? We know. You see someone like, oh, yeah, that, that person's part black. Yeah, definitely. Or native, right? And you like that, that person's native, 100%, without a doubt. And, and we know that. We see that and we understand it. And, and uh, I feel like every brown person, you know, I know. I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe a cousin or something like that. <laughs> but uh I guess, you know, I became Tlangok, I became aware of uh, my, my, really my Yupik and my black side pretty early on in my life. When, when was it with you guys? Let's, maybe I'll start um, with Natalie. When was it where you really became aware of your indigenous and your black side? And became, you know, what we say in, we say Tlangok aware. I've heard many times. So, you know, things like that. Yeah. I, I'm not sure that's a good question, but I would say it's when um, blackness was projected onto me as a kid and like that idea of othering me in my own like native community, that's when I realized I was like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm sticking out for some reason, but I was very little at that time. So that's when I became aware of po politics, blood politics as well. Um, uh, but growing up, like it's um, just being raised in a historically black neighborhood in an active Indian community in Portland was really special. And I realize that now after it's been like gentrified and I've been pushed out and now I live in Southern Oregon because I couldn't afford to live in Portland. But like coming from those communities, um, I was just afforded a really rich experience of being uh, black and Indian and, and coming from those communities and family who, who are about it. Um, so there never was, there never was a lack really. It's, um, I just remember always knowing and being, but also remembering being othered and being projected on. Um, and that's a part of my experiences. Uh, that's the best way I can explain it. Mm, Brianna, Martha, uh, maybe let's see if you can share your screen and we can get a little bit of 
Let me try it again. Say a prayer. I'm praying. Well, getting there, getting there. Do you see some moves? How's that? I see now, yeah. (laughs) Okay. Say a prayer. See, the prayers work, dude. Okay. Can you see that? That's my mom and my dad. And here's my dad and me. And um, this was the last time that I saw my dad until I was 12 years old um, because this was the first time they uh, broke up. And um, and this was my dad. He, t- he took me to the park across the street from where we were living and he brought his uh, camera and his tripod stand and, and we did a selfie. Um, mm. Parents were very young, you know, you can see my mom was so young and it was in the 60s and it was p- during the civil rights era. So I was the product of their meeting. Right, and that's my mom as an elder before she passed away. Um, and here's our uh, five generations of women. So my mom, my grandma who raised me, my great grandma, my great great grandma. And, um, and I write about these women in a play that we have. Um, called uh, Bone Hill. Oh. Beautiful picture. Did you, see, did you get to see any pictures that time? We saw it. We saw it. Beautiful. Okay. Did you get to hear anything? <laughs> I'm we, not very good at this. <laughs> um, let's, Martha, um, you know, the beautiful, beautiful pictures. And who... Who and what informed you um, about your views on, you know, being black, being indigenous? What, what, what inspired and informed you the most? It was, I would say my mother. I would really say my mother um, and my grandma, um, simply because, you know, my mom was raised, uh, you know, during segregation. Uh, she, you know, we came from this coal mining town and you know, in her era, she was raised in the the fifties, and um, and they had Jim Crow, and so in the sixties, she became a part of the civil rights movement, and in the seventies, she became a part of the American Indian movement, and she when and she moved, when she moved to New York City, she um, you know met and married my dad, and so she knew very consciously that she would be having a child that was also African-American and it was really important for her as a product of the segregation Jim Crow era for me to number one, um, have uh, equal opportunities as any uh, white person that was out there and for me not to feel uh, less than because they were made to feel less than. Um, She was made to feel ashamed to be native um, they used to say that, you know, um, you know, Indians were lazy, Indians were stupid, you know, um, they didn't work hard, they refused to work. So, you know, they didn't um, get jobs in the coal mines and, you know, black people did that because black people at least worked hard, you know, so there was all of that. So there was a lot of shame that was, um, you know, being Cherokee up in these hills. And um, so uh, she also, like I said, you know, I was, when I was born, my childhood was, I was a a kid of the seventies and eighties, you know, and it was all about, you know, black is beautiful during that time. And um, so my mom, when I uh, came back to New York uh, as a a 12 year old, you know, in middle school, you know, my mom had every black magazine, you know, the Ebony magazines and the Essence magazines and all, and every time there was a, um, you know, a, a, a uh, black fashion model or anything embracing, um, you know, this African-American culture, um, you know, she brought that to me and made me um, feel proud of, of this lineage and proud of the history of the achievements of, the, of these people who, who built this country, who were taken from their homelands and brought here and enslaved. So, you know, she made me very aware of the story of where we, where we came from. And that was a, a, a 
the foundation of solidifying who I am. So I never um, felt ashamed of, you know, having um, African American hair, you know, curly hair or rocking an Afro or, you know, um, because we came from those worlds, those cultures where they have this kind of good hair and bad hair and the whole light skin, dark skin and don't get too dark and all of that kind of stuff. You know, my grandmother came from that generation of that, but my mom embraced all of it because her daughter was a product of all of these things. So, um, you know, I remember, I wish I had them with me, but there were some, a lot of pictures of uh, fashion models in the 80s, supermodels, early supermodels who used to wear their hair natural. And, and so I wasn't allowed to straighten my hair. Like all the girls were getting perms to like iron their hair out to whatever. I wasn't allowed to do that. The first time I actually straightened my hair, I was actually 22 years old. I had to be out of the house and on my own because she wouldn't let me. So. <laughs> that's very aware oh man I remember my you know like I said I grew up in in the ville but I did one of my first times getting away when I graduated from high school I I uh, did my undergrad in South Carolina and that was really kind of my first time really being um, immersed in in my black side of my culture just away from my family outside of my family and I remember um, hearing a lot that's when i started hearing different terms right and then they were and people the black people there you know the community was like hmm you're black but you something else too good kind of hair <laughs> and that was the one i remember that say that that good kind of hair i love that i was like yeah i don't have much of it right now um <laughs> this is my pandemic corona you know that i just i miss going to my my hair <laughs> my barber um but i do i want to ask a, a a question um uh to amber uh about your relationship to place and family and your culture um please share that yeah so um as i said i think i was i was i grew up mostly here in portland oregon i was born in la around my mother's folks and it was there till i was about 10 um and so I think a lot of my identity was rooted in like, you know, Watts and, you know, Compton and Inglewood and, and in my blackness. But my dad's voice was always there too, like, you're, you're Creek or, you know, he used to say Creek. He didn't say Muskogee until probably I was older. So, um, and then when we moved to Oregon, um, yeah, I think that in a way I felt disconnected from, you know, Watts, you know, that the place where I was enculturated as a black person there. And then like having to find even my blackness here in Oregon. And I struggled with my identity, I think in a lot of ways. Um, and I, I, I think I struggled with like my blackness in general too. Um, not, not knowing where I fit in, not knowing if I was black enough. Um, and when I think back to that, I, I, I wondered too if it was because, you know, when my dad would say, you know, you're Creek, I didn't really know what that meant either, you know, so here I am struggling with like this new place and where my blackness fits in and then what does it mean to be like Creek or Muskogee in like this new place. Um, but you know what's interesting is my, you know, my mom would like celebrate my dad's and mine, but I, I feel like she like saw my dad as like a Muskogee man and so she would buy like <laughs> really cheap crappy art <laughs> but like it was her way of saying like i see you so i remember we had this big like velvet picture of um an indigenous man praying and i'm sure it was done by like uh not an indigenous person <laughs> probably not a black person and you know he's praying and there's um like a, a skull next to him like a um a bull or a cow skull and he's praying and when i was little I used to think it was just like so tacky like I didn't want my friends to see it but now that I'm older I realize it was my mom's way of trying to say like I see you you know and I and I honor that and I think you know now I'm looking back um how fortunate I was to have a mother a black mother who saw like you know uh our blackness and our indigeneity worthy of being like seen and so again even though I didn't feel like necessarily at home in Oregon yet or Oklahoma was still this place that I needed to go like I needed you know my dad would talk about it all the time and how he grew up there and how 
my, you know, my grandmother grew up, you know, was born there and our great grand and all our Muscogee family, it was just so distant, you know? And so I, I felt like I needed, I needed to go to Oklahoma. And even now as an adult, after I've been there a couple of times, like it, it holds such a special place in my heart. Um, and every time I go there, I feel like rooted too in my identity. And um, like Martha was sharing, my, my grandmother used to say like, or my grandma told me um, recently, she's like, yeah, be proud of who you are. They used to say that we're stupid Indians. And she'd say, we're not stupid Indians. We're, no, we're, no, we're not those stupid Indians, you know, but these are, this is what outside people would tell us, tell us about ourselves. And she, you know, she's like, you should be proud of these, the people you come from. And I, and I said, I am grandma. Like, you know, this is, uh, this means so much to me. And she said, well, I'm so proud of you for loving being um, native. She's like, I didn't know that you were. And I said, I just didn't know all that I know now. You know, I said, if I would have known it as a child, I would have, I would have had the same pride. But when you're disconnected from that land, right? Like we, as indigenous people, we talk about the importance of being like rooted in our land. Um, when you don't have that, or you're separated from that, um, how do you know yourself? Like your ancestors are buried in those grounds and, you know, um, that land knows you. And even though Oklahoma is in our original homelands, it still is the place that we made ours when we were forced, you know, to go there. So my relationship to land now is like, I know Oklahoma is like a weird place to people and they're like, why would you ever want to be there? But being on my family's land, being with my grandma on the land. So that, I don't know if you guys saw that picture of me standing with my grandma, like 20 feet away, because that was the COVID picture. Um, every time I'm there, I just feel, uh, I just feel, I don't even know how else to like explain it. Like, I just, like, I feel home. And I know like four or five generations of my people lived on that land, you know? So. Rihanna. Yeah. Well, I want to move to, um, it's so beautiful to get to know you guys and your background, your history and ancestry and your ancestors and seeing those pictures. Um, I want to move more to get to a conversation about our practice now, our professional side. Um, it was great to get to know your personal side, but um, professionally, um, we'll get a chance to just uh, all of us to introduce kind of our background and our, our, our professional practice, um, performance, art, uh, activism and that uh, and how it informs. But I'd love to, uh, let's start with Martha to give me about five minutes or so uh, of your kind of your professional practice, Martha. Sure. Um, I started uh, songwriting and singing a long time ago now, many years. And, um, and I work with my husband and who's my longtime collaborator. And we've been together for um, this uh, past August was 28 years together. So, um, and we, he's from England and I lived in London and we lived together there and we were writers. We um, were, wrote pop songs. We wrote and produced pop songs for international artists. And at the same time, we were uh, also uh, writing songs for uh, a band for me to front as well. So songs that I wanted you know, that spoke to me, you know, my artist, solo artist songs. And we were mentored by um, uh, Junie Morrison and George Clinton of Parliament Funkadelic. Um, so Junie uh, was also living in London at the time and he lived about two or three blocks away from us. And so he um, mentored us, you know, for the first couple of years and kind of gave us our professional start in the business. And um, when we, I mean, right away uh, when we, first started making the songs, my artist songs, what I wanted to say. I knew that I had stories to tell, stories to share, and I knew that I wanted to um, honor my family and, um, and kind of find a way to include this in the, in the music. And so that's how I did it. So, um, and uh, I didn't, um, it, it was uh, in my music, it was, I would say, it was a conscious decision to um, reflect both sides because I love soul music. I love rhythm and blues. I love roots music. I think all of it is all part of the foundation of these black and red people in this country. And, um, you know, there have been, there are indigenous people um, and African people all over this planet. But the blues comes from 
America, you know? Something else, another combination of music has come from in other, in other continents. But here, the blues, and the blues is, is, you know, Southeastern, and that came from the combination of the people who were brought there and, and the people, the first peoples who were there. And so um, that's kind of what's been the, the big influence on, on, on my music. Um, I don't know if I can share the screen, if I, if I have time to do that again. Let's see if I can make it behave. <laughs> if I can't, then you have to go to see me on Spotify. <laughs> Let me see. See if I can get that to work. Uh, can you guys see that? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm just going to do a couple seconds. You know. Martha, you and I have had the opportunity and chance to share the stage um, and performance um, many, many times. I've, yeah, and to see you and hear you, and um, it's so powerful. I remember, I think our first show together was back in 90, 98, 97, 98 or something like that. It was, it was a long time ago. It was a long time ago. <laughs> and um, those are some good, you know what, we were the pioneers of, of this and we were like, um, I guess like the only other group before us uh, celebrating uh, being black and, and native was, you know, maybe uh, the, um, the meters, you know, the Neville brothers. The Neville brothers. After that, we were the only two out there and, and I know that people, um, I, I mean, I know from just for myself, like with us being out there, it was so maybe a different experience for you being in, in Yupik country. But for me, um, I had so many mixed reviews. I had people who were just like in tears and, and saying, thank you for, for speaking your truth and thank you for celebrating us. And then I had um, some people, you know, uh, angry, um, you know, some white people really angry because I didn't look native enough for them. And, you know, I had people in the native community saying that I didn't look native enough. Yeah. Um, I had, I remember one time uh, there were two elders who said, um, why do you wear your hair like that? <laughs> you know, and, you know, you don't, you, you, you're Indian. You don't have to go around saying you're black, you know? Mm. And, um, you know, things like that. And then I had um, people in the African-American community sometimes say, oh, you know, I'm so sick of all these light-skinned people trying to say that they're Indian. You know, these people ain't nothing but slave trash. They just don't want to be black. They just don't want to be, you know, so there was a lot, you know, I had all of this in the beginning. And, and I thought, I remember um, being at a formal event with this, you know, and performing and, um, seeing some, just being met with this kind of, uh, you know, aggressions, you know, because they're not passive aggressions, they're just aggressive. And, um, and I thought when I, I went back to the hotel room, 
And I said, wow, I had no idea because at the same time, there were other performers who were native and white or had straight hair or, you know, pale skin or, you know, fit the phenotypes that people are addicted to, have become addicted to over time. And, um, and I remember thinking, I don't want to be a part of this, you know, not my gut reaction was like, why, why are people being this way? And then I thought it's because we need to educate people. I need to, I need to do more. I need to do more because people need to see us more mm -hmm. and understand that we are part of this country. We are, our culture means something. Our culture, uh, you know, as black and indigenous people has been erased. They're trying to erase us from the conversation. Our histories are no longer, are not, have never been taught in schools. And the little bit that has been taught has been a lie. And so we are the ones who have to get out there in the trenches and, and speak our truth, you know, and stand up for who we are. And that was, you know, like you said, like what, 98 or 97, 98, 99, something like that. And here we are. And I'm so proud today, you know, I, I made a post in Instagram, you know, saying on Indigenous Peoples Day that I remember those days when we were, you know, on the road passing each other and stuff, Stephen, you know, and, um, you know, and I remember those times when it was like we were the only ones and we felt like we just have to do this because this is how we honor our home. This is how we honor who we are. And here we are today with, you know, what, 450 something people here just like supporting, believing, sharing their stories. You know, we're giving ourselves our our space to be. Yeah, Brianna. Amber, Amber, can you share a little bit more about your, your uh, professional practice? Um, sure. Um, and I, I'm going to show my slides while I talk, because again, I think they'll be more, <laughs> um, more informative while I speak to you. Um, yeah, let me, let me work on this really quick. Uh, of course. I just learned this whole share screen thing, so I'm getting good at it. Um, okay. You see that? You guys see that? <laughs> okay. So um, I want to say that it's taken me a little bit to actually call myself an artist. I don't even... I'm still trying to embody that in a lot of ways uh, because a lot of what I do is talk. And so I don't know if <laughs> talking, you know, necessarily is um, art, but I think a couple of my friends have started to persuade me that um, writing um, is, and speaking to a truth is art. Um, and so what I want to say is that I've come to understand that, you know, something the great Nina Mo Simone said is that, the artist's duty is to reflect the times. And in a lot of my work, that's what it is, is like I'm reflecting what a lot of us as Afro-Indigenous folks and Indigenous folks and Black folks have been speaking to for a long time. I'm, I'm trying to convey a message that, um, you know, white supremacy and settler colonialism is in our identity. Um, so this is what I do with these memes online, you know, on Instagram mostly, but also Twitter is like, you know, put out these memes so that we can start having conversations and speaking to each other about um, how we see ourselves outside of these frameworks, um, outside of this colonial, settler colonial project. Um, and I think it's a way to hold um, accountable oppressive systems. Um, and I think I use the art to reflect um, issues that I find important within indigeneity and blackness. Um, and finding ways to like galvanize black and indigenous uh, uh, partnerships as well as like our individual struggles. Um, so both of our communities have been radicalized under white supremacy and settler colonialism um, and also racial capitalism, whether we've chosen, chosen to be activists or not. I think a lot of us don't realize we're born into this activism, right? It, it's not really um, something we have a choice <laughs> to participate in or not. It, it kind of shows up at, at our door. So I think like simply existing is um, political. Um, to, and I think to live as these 
you know, in these bodies and in, in our cultures and our identities um, is to threaten and expose the systems um, for the frauds that they are. And so I think I use this art um, as a way to address like black liberation, indigenous sovereignty, tribal sovereignty, anti-blackness specifically within the indigenous community um, and to affirm Afro-indigeneity uh, and to challenge like blood quantum and degree of Indian blood type, you know, um, politics. Um, and sometimes, you know, just to like decolonization, because I think all these things are the act of decolonization. I think sometimes we speak about decolonizing and we see that online all the time, like we need to decolonize, but decolonizing is a verb, like we're, we're supposed to be actively doing these things. Um, so in a lot of ways, like I'm still learning to navigate each one of these like modes of resistance, as I like to call them. Um, I think about my meme art, I guess. <laughs> meme art sounds, you know, funny to me, but um, just, you know, initially it was about speaking to myself, speaking to affirm myself and my own identity, to uh, challenge the oppression like I felt, um, to rebel against like the normalization of um, oppression and like my state of being and also just to demand accountability. Um, I just think it's important to uh, expand my own frame and challenge my own notions of these things that I speak to. So again, it's like talking to myself, but then also trying to be in community with other folks who are also doing the same thing. Um, and I've definitely struggled with imposter syndrome and wondered what authority I had to even speak to any of these things, you know, because this isn't my like scholarly discipline. And I think in a lot of ways, like scholarship, I like, I value scholarship. And so I question whether or not I have the right to even get online and like say these things. Um, but, you know, I want to give my grandma a lot of thanks because I think she freed me in a lot of ways to live authentically as Black and Native. Um, She's just been sharing her life with me um, and sharing her own experiences uh, with me. And then I, I totally want to give praise and thanks to like the ancestors like James Baldwin and um, Toni Morrison, who I think in a lot of ways have, you know, given me they've kind of given me the vocabulary and the authority to um, speak to my oppression um, and to speak to white supremacy and settler colonialism um, and to call it for what it is. And I think I've also been very much informed by um, Black feminism and Native scholars. Uh, uh, so like Nick Estes and Kim Tallbear, Eve Tuck and Kay Yang, uh, Shania Cordes, who is an uh, Afro-Indigenous woman who speaks to like um, Afro, the intersection of Afro-Indigeneity, um, I think in the Caribbean or South, Amer uh, South America, Central South America, but her scholarly work is amazing. And then Gregorio Gonzalez. I mean, I think all of these folks, my contemporary scholars um, have taught me like uh, Indigenous Studies 101 because that, you know, I didn't learn that anywhere. Um, you know, so uh, I think also just being in community online um, during quarantine has um, just been so helpful. I feel like I've learned so much from my counterparts online and sharing and bantering. And um, like, I see some of my friends on here who like are in Blendian country, which, which you know, we formed as a um, way, if you're not on Blendian country on Instagram, go there because, we, you know, we're a community of Black and Native folks who are just, we're doing a thing, you know, we're trying to like use a platform to talk about our identities and like the complexities of those and how we all have these unique stories and these unique histories, but we're for each other, we're for our Blackness, we're for our indigeneity. And so I just want to say, to my peers who have been online with me, supporting me and rooting for me. I'm, you know, I've been really grateful because I've grown in my, um, in my identity and in my like steadfast, steadfastness around being, being a black and native woman and feeling um, that it's okay to have that duality. And I think I've come to the understanding with my art that there's no conflict in my blood, right? Only solidarity. Like my black and native side aren't fighting to decide who's more worthy or who's more worth anything. If anything, they're both yelling like, um, 
this existence is worthy and it's beautiful. Um, and I hope that, you know, my ancestors are proud and I hope that my contemporaries are proud and I hope that my descendants will also um, find me a worthy ancestor. Mm, Brianna, Brianna. Um, Natalie, can you share a little bit more um, your, your professional practice? Can we to hear? Yes, sir. Let's see. So, let's see where we at. Can you see that? Yes. Is that Alaska? No, this this is my homeland. This is uh Dewa. This is kind of like these are my children. Oh. Um yeah, I think it's time for me to just to talk to give you a little bit more of the terrain that I'm tracing and to give you a visual of where I'm coming from and like who I'm doing this work for. I'm um a mother of three as my son, San Francisco Yellowhammer, Kolika Coles, and Lofani Tani. Um and when my son was four. Um, I decided to go back to art because I quit for five years after my second daughter was born because I was, um, I had a stint, I had an opportunity to go to go to the Smithsonian after she was born. Um, and it just turned me off from participating in the Indian art world. And I didn't want like any more of that. I just stopped because if, now I know there's a lot of anti-Black within these institutions that are Native American and they were coming for me all the time, but I didn't know why. And so I stopped doing work and I just, I stopped my studio practice and I ended it and I was focused on being a mom and returning to my homeland and just really like figuring out how to um, self-determine myself on my own terms. And then all of a sudden I decided like to go back to it. I was working for my tribe and social services full time. Um, taking care of a family of five with like limited resources and I needed like a way out and I needed to and I and I just bet on my art and I bet on myself and I went to work and I googled the top MFA programs in the United States applied for four of them got into them and eventually chose Yale so then I chose to leave my family and my homeland and to um, really put time into myself, into my art, and to figure out how to um, broaden my audience and give myself a chance to escape the Indian art world, really. I mean, I still I still have a lot of support there, but I feel like it's really limited. And I, um, I just feel like the way we see Indian, the way we see Native American art is compromised by a lot of times blood quantum and, and a way of seeing Indian that doesn't include me, and it doesn't include my children, so I produce I just worked that really hard at producing a studio practice that's sustainable, but also um, pushes back at the curated ideas of what Indian is and um, holds space for people like me to then identify past these um, problematic ways of seeing Indian and being Indian. Um, and I got a lot to say and I'm, and I'm no longer like I'm no longer like restricted by blood quantum. I'm no, I'm no longer restricted by these things that have, have been used against me. Like that's why I'm so like privileged and like so um, lucky to be black because it shows you a different way of, of part of like a belonging to communities that aren't determined by blood quantum. Um, that I, when I get hit with like these ways of self-determining myself or um, I can say no to them. So anyways, um, I say no a lot in my work and I, I just offer power objects as a way of refusing um, identity, certain identity politics. This is my dad and I, Shaki took this picture of uh, my graduation from Yale. So after Yale, I came home and I developed a studio practice um, that's about assemblage. I, I, I learned what assemblage when I, when I was at Yale and how that worked and how that functioned in like black art history is powerful, even on the West Coast. So I took that way of using materials to create meaning then into my own studio practice and a way to use the materials that come from who I am, my ancestors, and to charge it with meaning and then to offer you that. Um, and to charge these spaces and to challenge these spaces. Um, so this is my early studio work at Yale. I was um, combining materials to make meaning with. Um, developing a language around my work um, 
and also like seeing what the art world was outside of like these Native American institutions. It's like there's a lot out there and there's room for us there uh, and we belong there as well. And there's other conversations that are happening that we belong to be a part of as well. These are my putters, um, pussy hats. Just for time, I won't get into all the work. Um, on Thor series. So when I came home, this is the work I was doing is just like really charging materials, using materials I'm finding in my own communities. I'll go to people's houses and borrow things. Uh, I was like, can I borrow this? And then it'll actually be a part of the work. Um, this is my bang bang. Painted textiles. This is a beautiful elk hide I had. Uh, first cousin. Bonehead. So I'm thinking a lot about um, uh, gibbeting. It's like the execution and display of the criminal body and how that was done by the government in our history. And that's a part of like both my mom and my dad's side in that history. Um, it's always been what I've been thinking about. Um, and, it, and I've been, and I've been like attracted to it in a way because it's part of my history. Like my direct ancestor was, who's Kent Posh, Captain Jack. He was um, hung and beheaded by the US government and then his head was stolen. So giving you that history, it's just a part of where, I'm, where I live, my history, but I'm using it then to recreate, um, using it in my sculpture work to then recreate these bodies of, of resistance, some more textile work. Um, some more textile work, sculptures, rattle. I did a series about um, violence against women, in particular missing and murdered um, indigenous women and using and creating these tools then. So like, not if, but when I go missing, because of the probability there's like specific whys, like I will be affected by this epidemic. And so I'm providing then a rattle to call me home in ceremony, the North Star to find my way home. Um, and for my family, if I can't make it home, you come get me. Um, just thinking about my work in that way. A lot of mask work, uh, what's his name, Dick, Dick Bo? Bo Dick, sorry. It's huge in my practice. I love his work. He, he informs a lot of the ways I'm thinking about material. Um, this, is a, this is an exhibition I did at Nina Meyer Gallery. Um, Mama Bear 2, thinking about blood politics and who I've chosen to, re to make kids with and how that affects then. Um, how Indian we are and working through that, having two kids who are enrolled, one kid who isn't, and just like working through all that. Um, but you know, just seeing, being Indian and always claiming my blackness because I know that it never will compromise my indigeneity, like it's, and just holding firm in that. Um, so hopefully that message will then hold space for other artists that are coming up um, who, who can just power through these restrictions of the politics. This is my Watt piece. That's at Blum and Poe right now in LA. Um, and this is uh, the latest work that I did. It's at the Berkeley Art Museum. It's, we have teeth too. So the Berkeley, um, uh, the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum has um, ancestor bones. And so this is a piece in response to that. Uh, there's a lot here, there's a lot I could say. But I just want you to know that um, being Black and being Indian is, is a huge privilege. Um, and I'm just like really fortunate that I'm able to make work that I'm making and like be able to say something, even if I am by myself saying it, like I, uh, it's a huge privilege. And it's a lot of work. Yes. Brianna for sharing. Um, beautiful, beautiful work. Yeah, I think, yeah, we've all been informed so much from our backgrounds and our, our culture um, and both. Both have, are definitely shaping um, the work and art that we do. Um, I want to, we're going to be posting here, as you can see, a, uh, a poll. Um, this NACF is posting a poll for our folks that are on here right now. And uh, we hope that you, it's, it's super brief. It should take only a minute or two uh, to fill out this poll. Um, it's entirely confidential and it's for NACF uh, purposes only. You know, these types of 
data and things that are gathered, um, you know, demographic information that's important for developing, you know, future programming and outreach and, and development. So we hope that you will fill this out real quick and uh, it should be uh, in your inbox or maybe the chat, I'm not sure, uh, but I can see it right there uh, on my screen right now. But please take uh, a few moments to fill that out. And um, yeah, I guess uh, um, while you're doing that, I'll, I'll share a little bit about what what I do. You know, as you can maybe glean from our discussion, Martha and I, and talking about our background, our history, and how we've connected. I, I'm a musician um, and a dancer, uh, traditional dancer, and. I guess what kind of got me into that into that direction um, was the realization of of where uh, the state of our language was was going. Um, when I was born forty uh, something years ago, uh, I uh, there was about just under ninety percent. It was eighty something high 80s percentage of folks uh, in my home area that spoke our language. Like I mentioned, I, you know, Yupik was my first language. And, um, and so in my lifetime, now we have dipped under 50%. Um, and that was just something and, and by the, you know, when Philip and I and, and Aussie started, we were we were right around the I think we were you know just dipping under seventy into the sixties and we saw that as just like this is not right right so we got to do something about this but there's many many reasons why that was happening I mean of course um, many influences and medias that have been coming into our home area you know that were never there before um, the banning of our our languages the banning of our dances. On our ceremonies and 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 all of those um, all those pressures that were were really influencing um, the state of our our culture and all that all that encompasses that so you know when we made the decision to uh, go forward with our our artistic practice um, in Bamiwa, uh, we, we made it a uh, uh, we, we wanted language to be at the forefront and also traditional dancing to be in the forefront of that. So we started performing and singing in the Yupik uh, language and also influenced by uh, Karina Mula uh, from Greenland who uh, performs with us. And she's from, uh, she's from born in Kakoktok and uh, raised in Nuuk and also in Denmark. But uh, so uh, the language was just a really huge part of it. And so that's, you know, that's why we did what we, what, why we were doing it because we were seeing so many, um, so many of our young people that were not um, picking up the language uh, and, and perpetuating that, right? It was just, we were starting to lose it. So we were, we were really forceful and, and intentional about, about doing that. And I think a part of it was just being influenced by um, on both sides of my mom's side and my Yupik side or my uh, black side, my father, you know, I mentioned he was a minister, you know, the church uh, and singing in choir and that, uh, that really influenced us. So, uh, you know, we were singing these, these kind of Russian Orthodox cause we were in, in my village, they, there's so much I can get into, but in, in my village, the section that we lived in, was was designated to be Russian Orthodox, and if but if you lived across the river in the same village, y you were then uh, Moravian. Uh, it just depends on where you were located in that village, what denomination you were going to be. Um, so, and then also, you know, African Methodist Episcopal Zion. So there was this particular song, "Soon and Very Soon." We all were, you know, it was like "Soon and Very Soon," and we are going to see the King. You know, these gospel songs. And so Philip and I, when we were like coming up with this idea of of blending and and mixing our backgrounds and our cultures through music and dance, um, we were like so influenced by that song. But then we were also influenced by this traditional song called "Yuvia Ma Ushagamkan." Uh, which means my people, I come to you. And we're like, well, how are we going to 
how the hell are we going to mix that? <laughs> you know, like fix, you know, putting into the tune of soon and very soon. So we, we just kind of like our very first kind of song and that we sang and put together uh, was this, was this song we went, So, you know, we took this old traditional entrance song that was used in ceremony um, and then, you know, mashing it with this song soon and very soon which we grew up singing <laughs> you know in 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 our amy zion church and so that was kind of the the genesis of it as genesis of it all and it all just kind of just took off and um but that was it but how like i just definitely uh want to hear a little bit more of how the cultures the different cultures have informed um of your practice and maybe Martha we can start with uh, share a little bit of how how that informs what you create maybe a song or maybe talk yeah. about yeah sure um a lot of it was um for me I love uh the vocables I love uh singing the vocables and I love um you know, I, I love hearing, uh, and very similar, you know, coming from the mountains, being raised in the mountains with this, um, you know, old time gospel music. And, and it sounds different, you know, up there. It, 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 it has a, it's a very raw and, uh, and very uh, spirited um, style. And a lot of the old Cherokee style uh, gospel singing, they call it like a, you know, almost like a, a drunken singing, you know, but the drunken is not meaning alcoholic. It meaning is meaning high spirited, you know, because when you um, are singing um, traditional and you and you're in the spirit of it and you and you get kind of carried away. That's it, it's in that way. And so um, I've always loved those sounds and I love the combination of that. And I also loved hearing the melodies. You know, one of the things when you come from the mountains, you know, this mountain music is, you know, it's like I said, it's blues, it's gospel country, no matter what style that came to that mountain. The one thing that I uh, ended up having a great respect for was a melody. And so um, I kind of wanted to put it together because I also love to dance, but not 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 only traditional, but I like to shake my groove thing, you know. So, <laughs> and so, um, and I have a, a we have a we're really blessed with a real killer band um, that we've had, you know. They're all my big brothers, and we've been on the road for a long time. So let me see if I can if my screen will behave one last time, and I can play uh, something for you guys. So yes. let us pray. Oh, she, she behaves now that she's all warmed up. Okay. So I'm just, uh, I'll play a tiny bit of a hard living from my album. I don't know if you can hear that.
awesome, Guiana, for sharing that. It is so <laughs> funky. Well, we're coming down to the the close of our time together. I do want to definitely. Uh, I want to. I want to ask Amber real quick. Um, um, maybe one last thing. What's beautiful about being both black and indigenous? Real quick. Um, I just think the duality is is. I mean, I, I feel like, you know, I'm Black and I'm proud, I'm Native and I'm sovereign, and that's kind of how I see myself. Um, I, you know, celebrating these both amazing, resilient peoples who, like, in a lot of ways, like, we share so many beautiful aspects of being, you know, we have this reverence of ancestors and understanding the, like, connection to land and the natural world. Um, and I also think like we both we come from cultures of like, you know, call and response where, you know, we we say something and then we want to hear it back from the peoples that we come from. And I just yeah, like there is no shame for me in being either one. Um, we're just so we're such beautiful people. And I believe in our our brilliance. I mean, we we don't you know, I hear this thing online about like, you know, you guys are coming from oppressors and settlers. You're lucky to have us because, you know, now you have iPhones. It's like, we never needed iPhones to navigate the seas. We never needed iPhones to like grow our food. We never needed iPhones to like tell us who we are. You know, like we knew who we were and, and I think we're regaining that, you know? So yeah, I'm black and I'm proud. I'm native and I'm sovereign. Oh yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Natalie, same thing for you. You're on What's the question again? Oh, what? What? <laughs> About being both. Wait, I forgot. I forgot. Yes. Oh, man. What needs to change? What needs to change for Black and Indigenous people? Real quick. Blood quantum needs to change. Um, bones back, land back, liberation. A lot needs to change. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. That's a, that's a charged question right now, especially right now. Better health care. I need access to better health care. Um, uh man yeah um a lot needs to change but also like a lot is changing i feel and i feel like i can do the best change in my home with my children um i, I get some pretty dope kids um i'm really excited for their future so i'm i just really hopeful that i'm just hopeful for our future we need it we need a lot of change but i just know that i'm bringing up some really cool kids um, who will help facilitate that change. Thank you so much. I feel like we just, just scratched the surface. Just barely. Barely. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I want to say uh, for sharing. Thank you so much, all of you, for sharing um, your insight, your, your history, your ancestor, to see your ancestors um, and to hear your songs. It was so beautiful. Um, Ruben, can I see your face? I want to see your beautiful face, Ruben. Um, but I want to thank you, yes. Native Arts and Cultures um, Foundations, for bringing us together. Um, Ruben, do you want to close this out? Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody who's, uh, who showed up today. I, I mean, just running through the chat, there's, there's so much strong response. And so um, I just want to say that we'll have this webinar posted to our social media. Um, if you want to share it or review it again, um, I want to say thank you to all the panelists and to you, Stephen. Um, you're all just amazing, really um, amazing. And so um, bless you all. So you guys are sending out a, a, a you know, survey and webinar, all that stuff? So Yeah. Um, just want to let you all know we'll be sending out a post-webinar survey. Please fill it out. Again, it's so important for our work to demonstrate uh, who's been here and what your response has been. So. Okay. Juliana, thank you so much. Oh, bye. Oh, yeah. I was taking a picture because I was trying to send this moment. <laughs> this <color. laughs> thank you, everyone. Hug to, hug to you, hug to you, my family. Thank you. Be safe. You too.